Hey guys, how you going? I'm doing something different today. I'm going to break down a fight night. Benil Dariush versus Armin Sarukian. Um, there's no UFC this weekend, so I thought I'd fill the void. Um, so the first fight of the night is a matchup between two contender alumni. Not really high-profile fighters or anything. They've both had a, a little bit of a tough time in the UFC, although they still have really good records. So we've got Puna, Hale... Serranio, I'm not saying his name right, and Dustin Stalvolsovas. I don't really know these fighters too well, I have to admit. Panuel is favoured to win. Uh, they're both... I think this fight could probably go either way, given that they've both just not really had that much success. I don't really have much else to say on this fight, just because I don't really know much else about them. But it's interesting that they're on the main card. Should be a good competitive fight, though. Next fight we have Sean Brady versus Kelvin Gastelum. This is a really amazing fight. This is why I want to cover this card actually, because it feels like a pay-per-view card. Um, so Sean Brady, he's had a bit of a layoff. He's fifteen and one, pretty amazing record for the division. His last fight was his um, first loss against Bilal Muhammad. I thought that Bilal was going to win that fight. I remember because uh, Bilal is so underrated. I think. Um, Sean Brady is also very good, but he has had a few injuries, a few hiccups, a few cancellations. He was meant to fight Jack Della not too long ago, but he had to pull out. I think he had another staph infection, which is really serious. I kind of wonder whether all these tats are giving him a bit of a... Um, how do I say this? Well, the Yakuza, it's um, part of their tradition to do a liver detox every now and then because they have so many tats. So back in the day, the Yakuza in Japan would go detox their liver because they've got so many tattoos that those toxins get in your body. So I hope he's doing that because that could actually be affecting some of his injuries. You never know. I mean, it's an interesting theory because he does have a lot of tattoos. A lot of, uh, he has a lot of ink. Um, so I wonder if that's hindered him a little bit. But who knows? Sean Brady has a slight height and slight reach advantage, but not too much. They're very similar in physical stats. Sean Brady's favoured to win, but because he's had a few setbacks that are beyond his control, it's it's kind of interesting. You kind of wonder if he's been a little overhyped, whether he's struggling with a weight cut. Who knows? I feel like there's still a few questions. For uh, Kelvin Gastelum as well, Kelvin's lost five out of his last eight, but they were all high-quality matchups, like champions, pretty much. He has only won by decision since KOing Michael Bisping way back when, and since then he's only won by decision. Um, his last win was against Chris Curtis. I think that was a pretty competitive fight, although it is unanimous decision. And then he lost unanimous decision to Jared Cannonier. And then another unanimous decision to Robert Whittaker. Oh, so that's one thing I missed about Sean Brady is that he's been fighting once a year because of all of his injuries and cancellations, which is a little bit inactive, if you ask me. And it does raise questions whether or not this is the right weight class. I think he he is in the right weight class, but you just kind of wonder. Because he is still really big, even though he's short, he's really big. Say for Kelvin, Kelvin struggled to make welterweight and he's coming back for the first time in a long time. It'll be interesting to see how he cuts back down after such a long time not being at welterweight. Uh, so Sean Brady is favoured to win. Hmm, there's just so many questions on either side. I think it's fair to make Sean Brady the favourite because he has been at welterweight all this time. And although I do think some of his fights may have been catchweights. Kelvin Gastelum though has a really good uh, resume. Hmm. And Kelvin Gastelum is tough, but is he tough at welterweight? Because he's tough at middleweight because he has that extra weight advantage. This is really tough to predict. I, ca I wanna, I wanna favor Kelvin just because I'm not so sure about Sean Brady and his tattoos. And it's so stupid to say, but <laughs> I'll go. I, I'll say it's a very competitive fight. Kelvin Gastelum might just pull it off because Sean Brady has to deal with the. He's dealing with his first loss still, and we haven't seen how he's bounced back yet. And for an undefeated fighter, that can be quite a blow. We'll see. Because he has been slow to get back to the cage since losing, or the octagon, I should say. So I wonder. I think the edge, yeah. I'll favour Kelvin to win here by maybe a decision. 
Okay, next we got Rob Font versus Davison Figueredo. I've been waiting for Figueredo to go up and fight again for a long time. Bet he's delayed it for some reason or another, and I would like to know why. But he seems to be someone that won't fight unless he's 100% ready. So Rob Font has been very active this year. I think he's won, but he's only won one out of his last four. They've all been top contenders, though. His last fight was that, I think, a last-minute replacement for Corey. He lost that. His last win was at Adrian Yanez, and the, before that it was a last decision loss to Marlon Vera. So Rob Font's losses have been to very lengthy opponents, but up against Davison Figueredo, he will have the advantage in the reach and in the height, which I think will play to his advantage quite well with the boxing that he has. Davison, on the other hand, he has taken a while to come back after his last loss to Brandon Moreno. His last four fights have all been to Brandon Moreno, and I don't think that's a healthy thing for a fighter to be fighting the same guy, training camp for the same guy over and over and over. I think that's going to stunt your skill set a little bit. And also, he was very big at flyweight, and he, I think that was one of his main advantages back then was that extra muscle that he had but up against Rob Fon at a different weight class I don't think he'll have quite have that same advantage originally I was favoring I was thinking oh Figueredo would should probably be favored but after looking at the stats I can see that maybe Rob Fon has the advantage here I don't think Figueredo would really like feeling the strength of bantamweight because I mean he looks so strong at flyweight but because it's taken a little while maybe that's a good thing but I'm, I'm not so sure, just because of all the other stats that go into it. The fact that he's fought Moreno the last few years, it just doesn't seem like it's a great setup. But then again, look at his record. I think all his losses must be to Brandon, or most of them. And yeah, Rob Font has been extremely active, maybe too active this year. I still want to give the edge to Rob Font, just because I think that his boxing can win him this fight if he keeps the range. So the co-main event was going to be Dan Hooker and Bobby Green that originally was going to be the main event. Dan Hooker's gone and broken his arm in the same place that he broke it in the last fight against Jalen Turner. So Jalen Turner is going to be replacing Dan Hooker and fighting Bobby Green at the last minute though. The fact that it is last minute for Jalen Turner I don't exactly favour because he's a big guy and I think that the weight cuts may have been affecting him a little bit in his last couple of fights. For his conditioning and because it's last minute I think it's not going to be any more favorable for him. He's on a two fight losing streak which is a little surprising because he was having a lot of success for a while. He was winning five in a row. Uh, he lost that split decision to Matash Gamrod. I think that was a pretty close fight though to be fair. He has a massive height and re reach advantage and he's a lot younger than Bobby Green. He's 28, Bobby Green's 37. I just feel like this is not a good condition. To, well, he's not going to have good conditioning, but it's not a good situation for Jalen Turner to be taking a fight on short notice against Bobby Green, who's been very solid. Even though he's older, he's been look. I think he's been just looking really good lately, and I, I think a little bit of that is recency biased. Um, bias, but part of me feels like Bobby Green's maybe a little bit tougher than Jalen, and. Perhaps Jalen has learned a little bit from his fight with Dan Hooker to be a little bit more tougher mentally, but I just really feel like it may be time for him to go up to welterweight. Bobby Green, on the other hand, all of his um, last few fights have been this year, crazily enough. He had that quick KO win over Grant Dawson. I don't think Grant even landed a punch on him that fight. It was over in 40 seconds or something like that. Um, he submitted Tony Ferguson... And then there was a no contest with Jared Gordon. And before that, I didn't write down what it was. I think it was a loss, though. Mm, so there is a chance that he's been a little bit too busy this year. But he is prepared for this fight. He's gone through a training camp. I mean, if you were, if you were betting, it's not a bad bet on the dog for this fight. Just because I think that he's got better circumstances for this. And it is. I, I do feel like it's Jalen's turn to go up to welterweight. And he's coming off a big setback because he was expected to absolutely smash Dan Hooker. And the fact that he didn't, that's a mental thing he has to overcome as well on top of the short notice. So I do favour Bobby Green to win this just because of all the circumstances. 
It would have to be a, a decision, though, which would be interesting, I guess. Time for the main event, Benil Dariush versus Armin Sarukian. I'm guessing this is for some sort of top five spot. I haven't written down what they're ranked at the moment. Firstly, I want to say I think people are underestimating Benil a little bit because he looks so bad against Oliveira, but that was Charles Oliveira. I'm a little bit surprised that he's such a dog. That That is a good bet to make if you believe in Benil Dariush, I think. But don't take my word for it. Armin Sarukian, he's a minus 265 favourite. Uh, I don't know about that. But even though Dariush, even though he had a really bad performance in his last fight, he had a unanimous decision over Matash Gamot, which I thought that he fought, he fought that fight perfectly. He was, I thought he was really impressive in that fight. And Matash is meant to be some sort of number one contender right now, if you forget about all the other stars in the, in the division. And then the fight before that was unanimous decision over Tony Ferguson, although his fights have been very far apart from each other, so he has had a few setbacks. He's had a few injuries and fight cancellations, so that's a bit of a question mark. And sometimes Benil Dariush doesn't seem to come into fights with the right fight readiness. Maybe it's because he's having lots of babies right now and he seems to be in father mood. And <laughs> Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. I don't know if it's really great for him because he seems a little bit soft about it all. That could be affecting him. It could have lowered his testosterone a little bit, which might be affecting his performances, which could explain why he didn't look so great against Charles as well, although that was just Charles as well. Um, but he was still 34, so he's got a little bit left in his prime. I wouldn't count him out yet. I wouldn't say that he's over his prime at all. And Armin's 27, so he's not quite in his prime still getting it together a little bit. It's just still a little green, even though he's very talented and very solid as a fighter. What else have I written here? Yeah, so he's got a very impressive record, 20 and three. At lightweight, that's very impressive. But the level of fighters, I don't even know the last couple of opponents that he's beaten. So, and he lost that unanimous decision against Matash Gamrat, whereas I thought, was that close? It was kind of close, but I think Matash was definitely clearly a bit ahead of him. Benil has a height advantage, don't think that really helps too much. The reach is pretty much equal. Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's hard for me to say because people are saying Armin Sarukin's really talented in that, but we haven't really seen him up against someone who I would classify as elite other than Matash Gamrat and he lost that fight. Benil Dariush, he is really good. He just didn't, he wasn't there that night at Char with Charles or his style didn't match up well and I think a lot of it was to do with the length of Charles he wasn't used to that and the movement so I'm definitely favoring Benil to win just because I think he's had better experience at a higher level and Aaron Sarukin we still got a lot of questions to be answered he he's still only 27 so to think that he can to favor him to beat Benil Dayush at this stage is a little bit overestimating overhyping Look, maybe I'm missing something, but I just think that this is Benil's fight to win. Unless he's not mentally there and he's still in daddy mode and he's, he's obsessed with his daughters and thinking about nurturing them. So, yeah, I still favour Benil to win, though. So that's that's my pick. Probably a decision or something. Uh, lastly, I wasn't... I don't really like talking about this kind of stuff, but... Uh, I think everyone's going a little bit crazy over Ian Gary and his misses right now. It's It displays the way that this story is presented does seem really bad and parts of it, I guess, can be bad or interpreted as bad. But I think people are taking things out of context a little bit. I think what makes this situation bad is that so Ian's married to a much older woman. She has a background in media in the UK and in sports. So when they met... He must have seen her as a great asset to his career, not just only a great partner. And some relationships, yeah, someone is in control more than others, and I'm not saying that that's a good thing. It happens a lot. Usually it's reverse roles. Usually it's an older guy that is established in some sort of industry, and they come and they help a woman, a woman like um, Celine Dion. I mean, that's, this is not sports. She was only 15, and this guy, this manager, I don't know his name, sorry, he decides to sell his house, leave his family to um, develop her career, and then he ends up marrying her. And that's, how's that any better? But the thing that makes this situation bad with Ian and his wife 
is the fact that she released that book, Wags. And that does make it seem like she is completely playing him. I understand that, but I think, looking at the book, I think she's taking the piss out of herself a little bit. She's a bit self-deprecating in the way that she's written it. And I think people are overreacting a little bit. I think Ian Gary wants all this um, attention and media because the more that people talk about him, the more that I talk about him, the more that you listen to other people talk about Ian Gary, the the more that his star grows and the more money he can make because you're going to want to watch him fight. You're going to want to watch someone beat him or whatever. And I just think other people's relationships are no one's business. Like his relationship with his wife is probably no better than Rose, Nama Nunes and Pat Berry. But it's no one's business. I think if you have a big dream and that's your most important thing in life, so for Ian, that's him becoming a champion. And he's, say, I don't know how old he was when he met her. If you have, a, if all your dream is to become champion and you meet this older woman who seems all right, she's maybe a little bit controlling, maybe she is manipulative, but if she can get you to your dream, of course you're going to want that. And that happens all the time to young people, whether they, and they want it because they want that dream. Maybe later in life they will regret it, but that's what they want right now. And it's not really... It's upsetting because it's, it's really made a bit clearer when it's reverse roles, when it's a younger man and an older woman, but it happens all the time. And I think it's a mutual agreement that two people make that it's easy to sort of point the finger at, but it's no one's business. Um, and I think that they, they are both laughing about all this secretly behind closed doors because they're getting much more fame out of this. And I'm not saying that what she's doing is wrong or right. I'm not saying what Ian Gary is doing is wrong or right, but they are winning because people are talking about them. So I just don't think it's good to point the finger at someone when you don't know enough about the situation and don't really like what the media and what people on YouTube are saying. But I just think that, of course, you feel for someone like a younger person is always taking advantage of, and I think that's part of life. And also, they got a kid together, so that complicates things, but it's their business. So maybe later... Ian will grow up and he will think, oh, you know, I was manipulated, I don't want this. But I think there's more to their relationship than what the public knows. So I'm not defending him. I'm just saying that people should just uh, not really... People can't judge what they don't know about. So I just want to... I just thought I'd say that just for a different perspective. Anyway, I don't really want to talk about that kind of crap anyway because, yeah, like I said, it's not my business. It's no one's business. So Anyway, um, enjoy the fight and I'll probably see you next week to break it all down. But, yeah, enjoy the week and see you around the traps.